Welcome to the New America Foundation. My name is Peter Bergen. I run the uh, International Security Program here. It's with a lot of pleasure I get to welcome uh, our speaker today, Dr. Ian Morris, who's a historian and archaeologist, the author of this excellent new book, War, What, what It Is It Good For? The Edwin Starr Song. Uh, also the author of multiple other books, including uh, most recently, previously, Why the West Rules for Now, uh, which I think you've done both of these books in the last couple of years, which is sort of astonishing. Um, Dr. Morris is the Jean and Rebecca Willard Professor of Classics at Stanford. Um, he's going to address some of the big themes of his book, and then we'll open it up for questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you. <coughs> well, thank you for that uh, very kind introduction, and thank you to everybody for coming along today, when I'm sure there are like a million other things um, that you could be doing. Throwing away here, uh, kinds of things. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, it's, it's a it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, um, it's the first time I've spoken at the New America Foundation, so uh, that, that's really nice for me too. So yeah, I'm here to talk about this new book that Peter just mentioned, War. What is it good for? And the title, of course, I have stolen from the classic 1970 Motown protest song. Um, taken to the top of the charts by Edwin Starr, although it was first recorded by The Temptations, which not a lot of people know that, because it, it wasn't really their kind of song. Um, but okay, so the, ta the, the song I'm sure everybody knows well, uh, but no need to worry, I'm not about to start singing at you. But although if we'd done this 30 years ago, there would have been a risk that I would have started singing. Back in those days, all that I really wanted in the world was to be a heavy metal guitarist, and I was a heavy metal guitarist, and I played in a really bad band, and we made no money at all. And what I discovered, though, was that um, studying history and archaeology came a little more naturally to me than being a heavy metal guitarist. And what I feel I've also learned over the last 30 years or so of doing this is that history and archaeology are actually better ways to approach this problem of war, what is it good for, than by being I in a band. Uh, <laughs> and I, I come to the conclusion uh, from the, the, the work that I've done um, that I long-term history in particular shows you that contrary to what the song says, the song, of course, says, yeah, what is it good for? Absolutely nothing. Contrary to what the song says, war does seem to have been good for something across the long run. Not good for everything, obviously, but good for certain things. I think the, the evidence points us toward this kind of uncomfortable and paradoxical conclusion. And this is what, what I argue in this book, that across the last 10,000 years, war has made larger societies that have made their subjects safer and richer. This is the, the basic argument um, in the book. And I think we can, if, I mean, if you're interested in making a safer and richer world in the 21st century, I think you have to understand what war has done in the past. If you don't understand that, you're never going to understand how to uh, address the problem in our own times. So I think the, the, the question I raise in the title of the book in some ways is the most important question in the world. I mean, we live in an age where weapons are more destructive than ever before, and yet the world is in many ways safer than ever before. So how do we continue um, living in such a world? However, as I said, the, the answers that I offer in the book are paradoxical and uncomfortable. So my plan uh, for this lunchtime, I'm going to talk, uh, there's sort of four main claims I make in this book. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what these four claims are. Then I'm going to say a few words about why I think the world works in this uh, uncomfortable way. And then I'm going to just close by saying a few words about what I think are the, the consequences of um, the claims that I make, if I'm right. So the first of the four claims that I make in this book is that by fighting wars, people have created larger, more organized societies that have reduced the risk that their members die violently. And I think to see this, um, you have to go back 15,000 years, which I think is why a lot of people haven't seen this. Um, 15,000 years ago, at the very end of the Ice Age, everybody on Earth was a hunter-gatherer living in societies that were normally tiny. I mean, the, the, the group of us in this room here, for most people, this would be the size of the group you lived in, moving around the landscape a lot, um, going after wild plants and wild foods. Very small groups of people, very few constraints on people, very little structure and organization in these groups. And because of that, and because we're human, we're animals that have evolved to have the ability to use violence to solve our problems, if we think that that will solve our problems, people seem to have used violence a lot. And anthropologists argue over this extensively, but more and more anthropologists are now coming down and saying, well, probably in Stone Age societies, your risk of dying violently was somewhere in the 10 to 20% range, which is an astronomical um, level of, of violence. 
Now, if we fast forward to the 20th century, you know, we've had two world wars, genocides are committed, nuclear weapons are used. Somewhere between 100 million and 200 million people die violently in the 20th century, an astonishing number. But something like 10 billion people live during the 20th century, and that's a 1 to 2 percent rate of violent death. These surprising statistics, I mean, they suggest that your risk of dying violently has fallen by 90% since the Stone Age. Surprising statistic. But I think the explanation is more surprising still. And this is what I, I try to explain in my book, of course. But starting about 10 to 15,000 years ago, as the world warms up at the end of the Ice Age, agriculture begins, populations grow very rapidly. Um, before agriculture comes into the world, if two hunter-gatherer groups go to war and one starts losing, they've always got the option of moving away and hunting and gathering someplace else. The world is very empty, not many people around. As farming drives up the population, this gets harder and harder to do. More and more often, the outcome of wars will be that the winning group swallows up the losing group. Doesn't always happen, of course, but the, the long-term trend is that this is what's going on. The societies get bigger and bigger. Um, the people who run these societies find that there's only one way really to make these bigger societies work, and that is to develop stronger, more centralized government institutions of some kind. And they discover also that if you want to stay in power, one of the first things you've got to do is suppress violence within your own group. Uh, and this happens you know, not because these rulers are angels. I mean, they're not. They're politicians. And I assume in Washington, D.C., I don't need to elaborate on what, what that means for them. These, are, these people are not angels. What they want is people who will quietly get up in the morning and go out and work, generate wealth, pay taxes to the rulers so the rulers can spend it on really you know, whatever ruling thing enters their heads. And... Um, they want people who won't give them trouble. What they don't want is people who, every time they have an argument with their neighbor, pull out a knife and stab him, or burn his farmhouse down, or destroy his fields, or something like that. If you're a ruler, that is a disaster. So there's a kind of selective pressure on the rulers to pacify um, the, the societies they rule. The more you do this, the more in the long run that that group flourishes. The less you do it, the less it does. And of course, again, lots and lots of exceptions to this generalization. In the book, I refer to this as the what about Hitler problem, because Hitler, you know, difficult guy to fit in under this rule. And he's not the only one. I mean, you can have the what about Stalin problem or the what about Idi Amin problem. You know, pick your favorite mad dictator. There's no shortage of them. Um, but in spite of the people who obviously go against this trend, on the whole, across 10,000 years, the end result, the unintended consequence, has been that the rate of violent death has been driven down by 90%. As these societies get bigger and bigger and bigger, more and more internally pacified. I think in, in a way you can say the big story has been that war makes the state and the state makes peace. That has been the big story of history, I would say. So that's the first of my points, um, that they start making these bigger societies, safer societies about 10,000 years ago, and that's driven the whole story. The second claim that I make is that um, there's, there's actually more to it than that. In addition to making us safer, these bigger societies have made us more prosperous as well. That um, they, the peace creates the preconditions under which you can have more complex divisions of labor and more elaborate trade routes can develop and wealth can be driven up. Now, again, this is another paradoxical claim. You know, war is I mean, war is about killing people and burning things down. And, and I'm saying that killing people makes there be less killing of people, and burning things down makes there be more things that don't get burned down. Um, again, a very, very paradoxical effect. For me, though, um, <coughs> excuse me, the classic story, uh, I think, that illustrates this really nicely, one I draw on at the beginning of the first chapter in my book, is one that the Roman historian Tacitus tells us about a great battle that takes place somewhere up in the north of Scotland in the year AD 83. And the Romans have invaded Scotland, and this alliance of Caledonian tribes gets together to fight them. And Tacitus says, before the battle takes place, the Caledonian chief, a guy named Calgacus, comes forward and gives this rousing speech to his troops. And he tells us what this speech was. And um, the last a couple of sentences have become very famous, what Calgacus says to his men. He says, um, they, he means the Romans, they, they call stealing, killing, and rape by the lying name of government. They make a wasteland and call it a peace. I, I think this speech sums up um, the issues very, very nicely in a way. Because uh, the Romans go on, they win this battle, they annihilate the Caledonians, they kill everybody, they burn everything. And Tacitus says, next morning the sun comes up and there's absolute silence across the landscape. Everything is dead. They make a wasteland. 
And yet after the battle, the Roman army turns around, marches back south into England, into the areas it's conquered a decade or two earlier. The further south it goes into the areas it's conquered, the richer the landscape becomes. The, the, the bigger the farms, the, the, the higher the standards of agriculture, the higher the standards of living, the less violence is going on. And so we've got this kind of paradox. On the one hand, the conquests create wastelands. On the other hand, the aftermath seems to be, in effect, a kind of wonderland, a more peaceful, um, more a prosperous world. And so the obvious question, you know, which of these views is true, the, the Calgacus view or the sort of the Wonderland view? And it seems to me that the pattern we see repeated over and over again through history is that both are true, that conquest tends to drive a spike in violence and destruction. But if you come back to a place that's been conquered and absorbed into a larger society, you come back a century or two later, regularly what you find is that the place is more peaceful and more prosperous. So by creating bigger societies, stronger governments, greater security, war indirectly has enriched the world across 10,000 years again. So that's the second of the claims I make. The third claim, which I think is, is very important for the argument as a whole, is that war seems to be the worst possible way to do this, to make these bigger, safer, richer societies. And yet it seems to be pretty much the only way people have found. People hardly ever seem to be willing to give up their freedom, which is, of course, what you do when you're incorporated into one of these bigger groups. Give up freedoms, including the, the freedom to kill and impoverish one another. <laughs> hardly ever seem to be willing to do this without somebody forcing them to do so and, and using coercion. And obviously, there must be exceptions to this rule across the last 10,000 years, across the whole of history. But I found it really difficult to find um, convincing cases. And the ones that seem to me like sort of obvious potential exceptions, like the European Union or uh, the, the early period in the history of the United States uh, or, or some of the European dynastic marriages that go on in the Middle Ages, all of them turn out to have violence driving the story kind of behind the scenes. So um, as far as I've been able to tell, uh, there's, there's this line in the original song, War, What Is It Good For? It says, Lord knows there's got to be a better way. But as far as I can see, there really isn't a better way. We have not been able to find one. And I want to be clear you know, what I'm saying here. I'm not saying that you know, democracy and commerce and the peace movement and soft power uh, that are all irrelevant to making the world more peaceful. Clearly, that's not the case. Um, but I think they're always secondary factors. They're driven by the deeper the, um, primary force of, of war itself creating these bigger societies. So, okay, all of these three claims in different ways, all of them are very old claims. I mean, I'm hardly the first person to see this stuff. And most of them in one way or another, in fact, go back to Thomas Hobbes' famous book, Leviathan, published in 1651, which again, I'm sure everybody uh, will be familiar with. Uh, and the basic idea, because you know, Hobbes' famous line is about how in the state of nature, in the Stone Age, the life of man is nasty, poor, brutish, and short. And he says, what changes that is Leviathan, uh, which is a, a monster that you encounter in the book of Job in the Hebrew Bible, uh, where we're told Leviathan, he says, on earth there is no thing like him. He beholds every high thing. He is king over all the children of pride. I find it impossible to resist slipping into my monster voice when I read that passage out. But, um, the idea is Leviathan is government. Government is so scary that it intimidates everybody else and basically scares them straight. This is Hobbes' argument. This is the only way to have a more peaceful, more prosperous world. And I guess you know, my book is just, I think, the latest round in this 400-year-old war of words um, over what makes a more peaceful world. And I think Hobbes and his, his great nemesis Rousseau in the 18th century, when they were writing, basically, we didn't know anything. We, uh, they, they knew a lot about European, recent, their recent European history. They knew nothing about prehistory, almost nothing about anthropology. They reasoned and guessed their way toward the conclusions they reached. Now, I would say the difference is we actually have some evidence now. And now I think we're in a position where we can ground these claims on something a bit more factual. Well, anyway, so those are the, the first three claims. If they're true, I think that there is only one conclusion we can reach, which is that war has been good for something. And in fact, I suggest in the book it's been so good um, for something, for making in the long run, making peace and prosperity, um, that it's now beginning to put itself out of business, um, that we have weapons so destructive organization so effective that another great war could potentially destroy humanity altogether. A war, I, in a sense, is putting itself out of business. That's why the rate of violent death has fallen so sharply. 
So in the book, basically what I do is tell this 10,000 year long story, tracing the rates of violent death and, and what's been going on. Um, the way that uh, people nowadays lo love to talk about revolutions in military affairs. But uh, I suggest in my book that this is actually, the, this is a concept that goes all the way back. Um, that history has basically been driven by these revolutions in military affairs since the Stone Age. And I suggested there's sort of three phases we can look at the history of violence and war in. The first, the longest, goes from the Stone Age basically down to about 1 BC, for you know, as good a date as any. And by then, you've the, the old world, China to the Mediterranean, dominated by great, peaceful, prosperous empires. The Roman Empire, the Mauryans in India, the Han Dynasty in China, they've driven rates of violent death down massively from Stone Age levels. I suggest by about three quarters they've come down from Stone Age levels. But then the rates spike back up again in the early um, first millennium AD. There's a, a new great revolution in military affairs, which is the rise of really effective cavalry, which shifts the balance of military power to nomads living on the steppes. And basically I'm talking here about the period sort of sandwiched between Attila the Hun and Genghis Khan. And with them as your, 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 um, your, your book ends, uh, obviously we're talking about a period when rates of violent death spike back up. And I suggest that the rates perhaps double as compared to what the ancient empires had seen. Um, and this, this observation, I think, is important in two ways for what I'm saying. One is the way that it illustrates that uh, while I'm making this general claim that the overall effect of war has been to create the bigger, safer, richer societies, obviously not all wars do this. And sometimes not only do not all wars do this, but you can get very long periods, thousand year long period in this case, when exactly the opposite is the big trend. The, the wars of the period, say AD 200 to 1400 roughly. In Eurasia, instead of building up bigger, safer societies, they break them down into smaller, more violent, poorer ones, because the nomads are able to destroy the great empires, but not really replace them with anything. This trend, I suggest, is then reversed after about AD 1400, a new great revolution in military affairs, which is the invention of really effective guns, which gradually allow the great empires to close down the steppe nomad highway, uh, shut the nomads out. Europeans put these guns together with ships, export violence all around the world, and wage what in my book I call a, a 500 years war, from roughly 1415 to 1914. By the end of that 500 years war, Europe and its colonists, like, like uh, people in the US, control 84% of the surface of the world, which is a mind-boggling number. So, so that, I think, is one important thing about seeing this whole story, is seeing the, the, the variations that go on. But the second way it's important, I think, is what it tells us about causation. Uh, that um, while there's increasing agreement that rates of violent death have come down dramatically across history, there's no agreement over what causes um, this trend. And I think the big problem has been that the people doing the work have mostly been social scientists who tend to look just at fairly recent history, or say in case of you know, some of the recent studies by, say, Steve Pinker and Jared Diamond in their recent books, they look at recent history but also jump back to um, the Stone Age and, uh, and sort of look at this long uh, trend from the Stone Age. But what they see, because they go about it this way, what they tend to see is a single thing, the decline in rates of violent death. Because they haven't approached it really sort of historically, looking at it as a continuous story, I think they've missed this sort of this bulge back up again in the middle. They've missed the fact this is a more complicated story, where you've got three phases, an ancient decline, medieval rise, modern decline. Having three phases allows you to contrast and compare the three phases and start to identify what variables run across all three cases, which don't. And I think that shows you that, in fact, we can cut through a lot of the clutter about all the different variables that might be relevant to this story. And the one that we see running through all the cases is the wars driving the building up or breaking down of larger societies and the rise and fall of peacefulness driven by that. OK, well, I could happily go on all afternoon about the history, but I assume you don't want me to do that. Um, so I will move on uh, quickly to what I, I, th I would say is kind of the obvious question uh, that comes out of this, which is, why is this happening? Why does history work in this perverse and paradoxical way? And I think to answer that question, you've got to look beyond um, just the long-term history of the last 15,000 years and set this human story into a much larger biological story, which basically goes back 3.8 billion years, um, into the, the evolution of violence. And we've seen enormous advances uh, in the last 50 years in, in this field. And I think what most biologists would now say is that you know, 
pretty much every species of animal uses violence in some way, but of course they vary enormously in how they use violence, which suggests that violence is an evolved adaptation, that each species has evolved to use violence because in certain ways violence is good uh, for passing your genes on to the next generation. And what we see, each species has a totally different way of using violence. So like lambs and lions, say, use violence very, very differently from each other. Each species has its own kind of equilibrium point, the sort of sweet spot for the use of violence for an animal with those particular attributes living in that particular environment with those particular rivals and predators and so on. Each has its equilibrium spot. And each animal in the species is different from every other animal. But say, I mean, say you're a lion, and say you're a particularly violent lion, and you are you you fight even more than regular lions do. You are going to have less chance of passing your genes on to the next generation than the average fighting lion because you're going to get injured more quickly. If you're constantly fighting in really stupid circumstances, you will drop out of the gene pool faster. Mm -hmm. If you're a, a pacifist lion who never fights, same problem because you uh, other reason because you're going to be sort of pushed aside in the, the race for food and mates and so on. Same with lambs, same with humans. We are just like all the other animals in that we have evolved biologically to have a specific equilibrium use of violence, which is what we see back in the Stone Age, the 10 to 20 percent rate. So we're just like all the animal, uh, all the other animals, except for the one detail, of course, that we are completely unlike all the other animals. Uh, that our biological evolution l gave us the, the miracle of nature that you all brought along this lunchtime, uh, <laughs> pulsing away at the top of your body, the human brain, you know, nothing else like it, so far as we know, in the entire universe. Um, what that allows us to do is, as well as evolving biologically, so like, like other animals, as the environment changes, um, we, we change biologically very slowly into new animals. We also evolve culturally. We can change our institutions, have cumulative learning, respond to the changing environment very, very rapidly. And this, I would say, this is something no other animal can do. This is what has driven down the rate of violent death by 90%, our cultural evolution. Um, at the end of the Ice Age, as people start forming these bigger societies, governments raise the costs to using violence. The payoffs from violence decline. Humans responded by using less violence. And over 10,000 years, these cultural changes drove the rate of violent death down by 90%. And that, I would say, that, that's the big lesson we get from history that um, what Hobbes called the Leviathan, this is the mechanism which has basically scared us straight, driven down the rates of violence. This seems to be the one answer to the problem of violence. Okay, well, to start moving into a conclusion then. Uh, you know, if, if this is a correct understanding of the shape of history, are there lessons we can learn from it for the 21st century? And I think the answer is yes. And I'm going to pick up my story where I left off the historical story with the Europeans swallowing up the world when they get the ships and guns. I just try to draw out what I think is one, I, I think, quite serious lesson if this reconstruction of history is correct. So if we pick up the story back in the 18th century, at that point, Europeans are creating these vast intercontinental empires. So vast, people start to see in the 18th century, and particularly Adam Smith is the guy who theorizes this. So vast that the source of the wealth of nations is increasingly not what it used to be, where the Romans go out and they conquer somebody, they plunder them, they tax them heavily as subjects in the empire. Now, Smith realizes, now the way to make your nation rich is to, to back off, to, to let people truck and barter in their natural way, let the markets grow as big as possible, and extract your wealth from the biggest possible markets. Instead of trying to monopolize a market and tax it heavily, extract your wealth from the biggest possible market. And Smith's famous insight, of course, is that markets work best when governments get out of them. But the other insight he made that people often tend to, to gloss over, he said that also markets only work at all if government gets into them, that the government provides the playing field, enforces the rules, punishes the bullies who use violence. The markets don't work at all without the government um, keeping them going. And Smith seems to have been moving toward a conclusion that what the world needs is not a leviathan policing its own trade routes, but some kind of super leviathan that acts like a globo cup, kind of overseeing the whole system. That's what the world needs. And basically, this is what the world gets after about 1815 with the, the fall of Napoleon. Britain is the only industrialized power, bestrides the world like a colossus. Um, and although the 19th century continues to see savage wars, um, 
the rates of violent death fall lower and lower than ever before. Prosperity increases more, as does inequality. Um, Britain generates its wealth from selling goods and services overseas. In order to do that, it needs safe, secure sea lanes. So it tries to intimidate other governments that might disrupt the British system. But it also needs wealthy customers. You've got to have people able to buy the goods and services. So the British find themselves in this weird paradoxical situation of encouraging other countries to industrialize and get richer so they've got big overseas markets. And it quickly becomes clear. Economically, this is a triumph. Strategically, it's a disaster. And by the 1870s, um, the US and Germany in particular, industrialized, become so powerful, they're beginning to turn into serious rivals to the British Globocop. And what people discover is that Basically, the more successful Britain was at being the Globocop, the harder the job becomes. It becomes less and less clear to people that there really is a Globocop anymore by the late 19th century. And in the 1870s, when the pattern first appears, no one is going to directly challenge Britain. Nobody's that crazy. But 40 years later, this, in the 1910s, the situation has changed quite a lot. And more and more governments are starting to feel that Britain, nobody, is in a position to raise the costs of violence high enough that violence will never be the solution to your problems. And of course, particularly, there's a, a faction within the German government that starts to feel that you know, we have this horrible strategic situation trapped between Russia and France. Maybe violence is the answer, with results, of course, that we, we are all familiar with. Now, since I think at least 1989, um, the, the U.S. has been operating a, a system that, of course, in many ways, totally different from the British Empire. But there are some, I think, significant similarities. A huge wealth that depends very much on global trade, global finance. The U.S. polices the routes, keeps the playing field level, or at least looks level from our perspective anyway. Uh, encourages other countries to get richer so they can trade with the United States. And of course, China has been the obvious uh, beneficiary in many ways of. of some of these policies. And since 2000-ish, a lot of people have started to say that the People's Republic is now emerging as a great rival to the United States. Now, in the 2000s, almost nobody was crazy enough to challenge the US order directly. I mean, the Taliban and arguably Saddam Hussein do, and the uh, results are you know, very obvious. Because that was the same in the 1870s with the British, too. Um, it seems to me that if present trends continue, it's not impossible that in 40 years' time, we'll be dealing with a world very like the 1910s, where the, there's a globo cop, but it's not clear to anybody whether it's raising the costs of violence high enough to make it unthinkable. And if that is where things are going, then I think we will inherit the worst of all possible worlds, a one as unstable as the run-up to World War I, with weapons even worse than the weapons of the Cold War. Um, and again, if that's the case, I think the next 40 years promise to be the most dangerous in history. So, okay, the, the big lesson then I'd say is that peace and prosperity depend on Leviathans and Globocops. If we want a safer, richer world, we need to keep a Globocop. And really the only uh, applicant for the job in the world at the moment is, of course, the United States. Um, the alternative, I think, is a breakdown that will mean something like the rerun up to World War I, but this time with nuclear weapons. Now, obvious question to close with, um, can something like the, the US global hegemony, global coppery, can that continue forever? Is it reasonable to think we can just go on and on and on in, in this state? And I think the obvious answer has to be no. I mean, nothing in history has ever lasted forever before. It would be slightly surprising if this did. Uh, uh, when I, the book, my book came out in Britain at the beginning of this month, and when I was over there at the beginning of the month talking about the book, uh, I would uh, ask the audiences, uh, Imagine World War I hadn't broken out 100 years ago, in 1914. Imagine that hadn't happened. Do any of you think Britain would still be running the world? And after a week of these talks, I must have talked to close to 1,000 people, and um, nobody ever said, yes, I think Britain would still be running the world. Um, so does this mean that we are, in fact, all doomed? There's bound to be a decline of the US Global Cup. We're bound to rerun this script. Are we all doomed? Well, I have some thoughts on that too, but I've talked too much already. So for those, you're going to have to read my book. So thank <laughs> you very much for listening. <laughs> thank you. Shall I come back down? Thank you very much, Dr. Morris. Well, that was a brilliant uh, synthesis of a lot of um, so much history and, and thinking about history. I guess a sort of, um, uh, you know, you had a what about Hitler question. What about 
what about a Cuban Missile Crisis that sort of didn't turn out mm -hmm. the way it did? I mean, I guess, you know, human nature being what it is, things go wrong. Yes, yeah, this is uh, one, uh, just turn the chair a little yeah. bit. I mean, this is one, one, of the, one of the more worrying things in the world, is yeah. the sort of Cuban Missile type scenarios. And um, I guess, I mean, it seems to me, and I'm sure that there are probably people in the room who know a lot more about nuclear strategy than I do, but it seems to me that uh, the, the nuclear balance, the deterrence, was a really important part of keeping the world so peaceful during the Cold War. But I think also that there was this um, famous speech uh, Ronald Reagan gave in 1983, where he compared the Cold War, the, the balance of terror, compared it to two gunslingers standing in a saloon with their six guns pressed against each other's temples forever. <laughs> and he said, yeah, this is great. This works just fine, so long as neither gunslinger ever has a bad day. I think that, of course, is the, the bad right. day issue is the problem with the, the nuclear standoff. Well, and Reagan you know, went to Reykjavik and sort of had the conversation with mm -hmm. Gorbachev and basically you know, did yeah, the right thing. Just give the whole thing up. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, and, and you know, today we had the news uh, that for the first time in American history, the American middle class is getting poorer than a lot of other middle mm. classes in the industrial world. And the American poor are significantly poorer than a lot of Western countries. Um, and at the same time, you know, we can see that the India and the Chinese economy uh, is going to be larger than the U.S. economy, and mm, you know, fairly soon. Fairly yeah. soon. And of course, India and China, you know, had their disagreements. So, so I mean, I, I, one thing that I found surprising because I haven't read the whole book was your conclusion about this the next forty years being the most dangerous. Mm. I mean, the, I guess one difference between this period and World War One is that there was there was a set of uh, kind of. Uh, I mean, I don't think the outbreak of World War I was not necessarily inevitable. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, one would hope, if we are a learning species, that some of the same sort of sets of, well, we'll make different sets of mm -hmm. mistakes. But so, uh, you know, that, that you're in, it's a very optimistic projection, the book overall, but the next 40 years isn't. So sketch out mm -hmm. uh, how you think it might develop in a non-optimistic fashion or how it might... <laughs> continue on its sort of upward trend yeah. towards. Yeah, I think it's, it's a lot easier to make pessimistic <laughs> projections than optimistic ones. Yeah. Uh, there's just so many horrifying, terrifying things that you can focus on. But yeah, I mean, your, your initial point about the, the, the new um, arguments about the, the American middle class no longer being the richest middle class in the yeah. world and stuff. And again, this is another one of the sort of structural things where I yeah. think there are really striking parallels with what's happening to Britain at the end of the 19th century where very, very similar things are going on there. But as you say, I mean, World War I is in no sense inevitable. And the, yeah. the specific way that it broke out in 1914, of course, uh, and some of you will probably have read uh, Chris Clark's book, Sleepwalkers, about the outbreak of the war, which is basically this long list of all the ways this could not have happened. That is, yeah overwhelmingly bad luck that what did happen did happen. And I think w one of the big lessons of doing this long-term history stuff that I like to do is you learn really quickly to say you never use the word inevitable. Uh, you can never talk about anything being inevitable. All you can talk about is probabilities of things. And so as sort of larger balances shift, and again, it's very like evolution in that way, uh, larger forces shift around, the probabilities of some events go up and down, even if we can't quantify them with any uh, real precision. And I think you know, the more we r are rerunning the script of a pre-World War I, the, the, the higher the probability of coming to a, a similar, but of course far more disastrous ending. Mm. And of course you, you may well be right that we have learned enough at this point to be able to avoid that. And of course I think the, the obvious uh, cause for optimism there is looking at the end of the Cold War. You know, if we'd been here 50 years ago, and I'd said, it's 1964, you know, right after, a couple of years after the Berlin crisis and the Cuban Missile Crisis, and I breezed in and said, hey, you know, 25 years from now, those Russians are going to wake up one day and say, this, this whole communism thing, it's not working for me anymore. I'm going to stop doing it. I'm going to tear down the Berlin Wall. I'm going to get rid of 95% of my nuclear <laughs> weapons. Uh, it's going to be a bit uncomfortable. Uh, a couple of hundred people will get shot in Romania. But there will not be hundreds of millions of deaths from nuclear war. Um, and uh, the world after this will become so much richer and safer than it's ever been before. If I'd walked in and said that stuff, you would have thought I was stark staring mad in 1964. And yet, of course, that is more or less how things play out. And you know, mm. contrary to what a lot of people expected, I think by the 80s, a significant faction in the Soviet leadership 
is looking at their problems and saying, you know, force can't solve these problems. Um, sending the tanks into Poland isn't going to solve our problems. Invading West Germany is certainly not going to solve our problems. And uh, what, what Gorbachev does, of course, has these catastrophic effects for, um, for the Russians, as you know, Putin quite rightly pointed out. But it was way less catastrophic than it could have been. And so yeah, I think that we, we do learn from the past. We are capable of evolving more effective institutions. Um, the fact that we've driven down rates of violent death by 90% is, I think, cause for tremendous optimism about our ability to carry on doing this. Uh, my main reason for pessimism, I would say, is that when you look back over your, how this story has gone in the past, what you see is that in the past, there's always been kind of multiple natural experiments running. Right? And what I mean by that is, you know, say, back in the Stone Age, you've got thousands of separate little bands of hunter-gatherers. In the age of great farming empires, you've got dozens and dozens of great powerful states. They're all running this experiment of sort of pacifying themselves and fighting fewer wars. And um, almost all these societies break down in the end and come to a, 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 an unhappy ending. But there's enough that figure out the ways to do things that um, the story keeps moving, the rates of violence keep coming down. Now I think we're in a world where there's really only one experiment running. And if we, if we screw this up, then of course we do have the potential to destroy everything. And so my, the, the, the reason I drifted toward an optimistic ending is that I think there are just, um, just a lot of potential game changers out there. And uh, I... Uh, so what, what are they? Well, I think the big one that I focus on in the book, uh, a lot of people think I'm just completely insane, uh, but um, is the technological changes, uh, which I think um, one of the big things we see driving down the rates of violent death has been the way that leviathans in the past have kind of integrated more and more people together uh, into, a, very loosely, but into a, what we can call a kind of super organism, where you know, the, the state functions as a larger group of the individuals are part of this. And um, as time has gone on, the ways uh, these superorganisms have been integrated have changed. And I was talking about you know, Adam Smith's observation of the 18th century that increasingly the world has now become so pacified, the, the organization's so big, that now things like commerce start to become important. Democracy takes off, that becomes important. Uh, seems to me that the biggest hope for a sort of rapid jump in these kinds of integration is some of the, the technological trends toward people merging both with and through their machine, with, uh, with their machinery and through their machinery with each other. Uh, which, again, I talk about this at, at some length at the end of both of the, these books that you showed at the beginning. So I think it is one of the, the big game changer in a way. And uh, I live on the edge of Silicon Valley, so I'm surrounded by these rather wild-eyed techno gurus who are always telling me that you know, next week we will solve all the world's problems. <laughs> and I've heard enough predictions now <laughs> to have become somewhat skeptical about these. But the, the big direction that the developers are taking is, I think this does seem to be fairly clear. Um, the, uh, and the, the analogy a lot of the techno guys like to say is that this is a little bit like the evolutionary story that I was telling. That um, about, uh, gosh, I'm sure I get all the dates wrong here, but about a billion and a half years ago, the, the earliest life forms, these little globs of carbon-based globs that replicate themselves, they have a little tiny bit of information and then they replicate themselves asexually. These start to merge together into larger, simple, single-celled organisms. They give up their blobness and merge together through a process of competition and cooperation to become single-celled organisms. About 700 million years ago, those start to merge together, giving up their cellness to become multi-celled plants and animals. Um, and one of the ways the techno geeks like to look at what's happening now is to say that, well, basically, we are at the very beginning of a new process where individual humans are giving up more and more of their individualness and merging into this much more tightly integrated superorganism. Mm. And I think the further we do move in that direction in the 21st century, the more that using violence to solve problems will literally be a matter of cutting off your nose to spite your face. The, the, the payoffs from violence will continue continue to go down and down. And um, so I suggest at the end of my book that perhaps the big issue in the 21st century is going to be a kind of race between a transformation of this kind and the breakdown of the current global order 
made even more complicated by the way that a lot of the short-term implications of the technological changes actually seem to be driving some of this increasing inequality and uh, surging wealth in some parts of the world and growing instability. So this is why I say I think the next generation is probably the most dangerous in history, but why I also remain reasonably confident it's all going to have a kind of a happy ending. <laughs> So you, you say the war, uh, the war, uh, war makes a state and the state makes peace. So it's not the war, the state makes peace obviously internally, but also mm -hmm. it makes peace with other states and creates a set of rules by which rules of the road and the United States is doing that right now and mm -hmm. the UK did that in the past. And that's part of the argument, right? Yes. Um, yes, I think they, they, the states make peace internally because what they also do, I, I steal, sort of steal and distort this line here, war makes a state and the state makes peace, from a very famous essay by the, a sociologist named Charles Tilly. Who, and his argument, looking at the last 400 years of European history, was war makes the state and the state makes war. Uh, because as these states get bigger, they wage ever fiercer wars against each other. And he's absolutely right about that. But I think what he, he missed, because he w just wasn't looking at a big enough chunk of history, was that the overall effect, in spite of war making states that make more war, is, is toward less and less violence. Because the states get bigger and bigger, and the internal pacification more than outweighs the, the more people are getting killed in the wars. The wars, of course, get bloodier and bloodier, but the populations grow and grow and grow. Until, when I, mean, I say with the Roman Empire, you've got... Uh, 60 million people probably in the Roman Empire in the second century AD. The armed forces are roughly 350,000 men. Even the most disastrous campaigns, uh, you're talking like military losses of uh, in the 20, 30,000 range, and civilian losses that we, we can't quantify, but probably higher, um, so maybe you know, three, four times higher. Um, but out of a population of 60 million people, so it's, again, this paradoxical thing that it's a scant consolation if you happen to be living in the path of the Roman army. They come hmm. down through and burn down your village and kill you. Not much consolation to be told, well, ah, oh, well, the, the big story. <laughs> but the big story is still there. And I think that the, yeah, war makes a state, the state makes peace, because the scale, because of the bigger organizations, the scale goes up and up and up, and the pacification outweighs the, the, the more violence. We're talking about the, the global, the United States is sort of the global cop at the moment, and uh, we have a sort of, we're in an interesting analogous situation in the sense with drones and cyber mm -hmm. warfare that we were, which we sort of have a, have a monopoly on that's evaporating. Mm -hmm. What is the responsibility of the global cop in that um, environment in terms of making rules of the road for these kinds of new forms of warfare, which, by the way, will kill less people? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I mean, a cyber attack can maybe kill no one. Yes. Yeah, um, I think in, in the past we've seen Globocops or, or, or the Leviathans when you go yeah. back before the 18th century, but, but trying to establish rules on how people fight wars. Um, I think one of the things you, you see over and over again when these great powers break down, you know, again, whether you're talking about the Roman Empire or, or not, that very often part of the reason they break down is that there will be some kind of revolution in military affairs going on, which is one that doesn't work to their advantage. I mean, we tend, because of the recent history, we tend to think that these RMAs are always driven by the, the richest, most advanced technologically, uh, uh, most sophisticated parts of the world, and they're not. Um, that uh, I'd say, you know, the, the example I, I mentioned when I was talking about the collapse of the great ancient empires, this is driven by this revolution in military affairs that's created not in Rome or China, but out on the steppes where um, pastoral nomads out on the steppes are breeding bigger and bigger horses. And, and this is something I think often we don't think about much today, but you know, if you'd lived in 1000 BC, there was no horse anywhere in the world that you could get on the back of and ride around all day long. They just were not big and strong enough. You could yoke a couple of them to a chariot, you know, light wicker chariots, and that could pull you around. And, uh, but if you've gone back before about 4000 BC, you couldn't do that either. They just weren't big and strong enough. And the guys out on the steps breed these bigger and bigger horses, and then discover, hey, this is great. I mean, we, we step guys are totally outnumbered by the great empires. They have these fantastic Roman and Han armies, you know, way better than us. But w a few hundred of us can ride in, burn down these villages, steal everything we want, and ride away again. And there's really very little the empires can do about this. The empires, actually, they, they quickly come to the realization that the only way you can stop this from happening is um, by paying people not to raid you. Uh, you say, you, you do this, they do these really cold uh, cost benefit analyses. They say, well, you know, those Huns, they're burning down our frontier villages. And that costs us X talents of gold in revenue every year. 
how about if we pay the Huns X minus 10 talents to stop it, just stay home? Because the problem is the Huns take the gold and then raid anyway. So they, they, they then find, OK, we've got to have a stick and carrot thing. We pay the Huns. But then every so often, the Huns just annoy us too much. We're going to go down there, and we're going to kill a lot of Huns. We can never beat the Huns, but we can kill a lot of them. But the, the long-term trend in that case, though, was that the, the balance shifts more and more toward these step guys. It's disastrous results for the empires. Uh, and actually, I've now completely forgotten what the question was. <laughs> well, I, mean, so I, I guess, I guess so, yeah, so who are the step guys in, in the present environment, uh -huh. if anyone? I mean, you know, yeah, Osama uh, bin Laden obviously tried, but yes. without much success. Yes. Yes. I mean, I, I, I guess I, I would say the best analogy for the sort of asymmetric wars the U.S. has been fighting in the last few years is, is not with the fall of the Roman Empire at all, but with the kind of wars the British Empire got into in the mid and late 19th century, when it, had, it was fairly effectively deterring other powers from doing things that would disrupt this British-dominated system. And you know, famously, Abraham Lincoln's big worry during the Civil War is that Britain will recognize the Confederacy, because that just will be a total game changer. And uh, before, before the Prussians attack the French in 1870, they make very sure that the British are OK with this. And the British are actually really keen on it. They think it'd be great to see the French taken down a peg or two. And then it turns out they, they didn't quite have this many pegs in mind. <laughs> Shocked to them. But um, so yeah, they, they create this world where there are very few real frontal challenges to the British order. And what you get instead is these much smaller actors saying, well, OK, um, Germany or the US is not going to go to war with Britain, but we can. And they get it in a series of wars um, in basically the same parts of the world that the US has been fighting mm -hmm. in against basically the same people, Islamist terrorists. So in, in Sudan, uh, the British get. There's an Islamist rising in the Sudan. It takes over the whole country. Uh, the British go down there, fight the Battle of Omdurman, overthrow this, this caliphate. Um, and they end up staying there until 1956 um, to prevent it happening again, which, of course, is a rather chilling um, analogy for uh, some of the things we've been involved in. I think that is the obvious analogy here. I, mean, I suspect that the, the phase we're in, the, although um, all, all military predictions are always wrong, but I mean, mine is that the phase we're in at the moment, in fact, uh, the, the RMAs are currently being driven by the big powerful states, and that mm. it, it is the computerization and roboticization. I'm not sure if that's a word, but these things happening in war are the, the next new big thing. And right now, I mean, I think I, I would agree with you completely that the short-term effect seems to have been driving down the, the numbers of deaths we get in the wars. And uh, of course, the, it's the, the computerization had a big part to play in the reduction of the number of nuclear weapons. Because you now, if you can land your missile within 10 feet of your target on the other side of the planet, you don't need a multi-megaton bomb to make sure you, you blow stuff up. You can hit the things directly. But I, I'm, l I guess, less sanguine that the long run effect is going to be uh, such a, is to drive the rates of death down if major wars break out. Yeah. One final th question. You know, I, I think in life, um, you know, when you say the sky isn't going to fall you know, in the long run, that you hope, you know, a lot of people don't like to hear that. I mean, you've, <laughs> you, you've been on your book tour already now. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. I mean, because there's lots of people saying, I mean, Graham Allison wrote a book a decade ago saying there would be a nuclear attack in the United States by terrorists. Mm -hmm. Well, there's no evidence of, of anything like that. Um, and that was treated very seriously. He's a serious guy. But when you go out and you say, well, look, in the long run, things are just getting much better. Uh, what's been the reaction? Mm. Yeah, mixed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> say, uh, definitely mixed. Um, I think there, there, there are some people who don't like the idea that the world might be getting better. And mm. I've never understood why anybody would feel that way. But there, there are people who are strongly emotionally committed to that. And just like, of course, there are the people on the, the other side who are emotionally so emotionally committed to the idea that everything is getting better and better that they just don't want to hear any suggestions about things actually getting worse. So I think that, you know, there are always some people who it doesn't much matter what you say. Uh, they, they just don't want to hear it. But I've found that pretty much everywhere I've gone, there's been sort of you know, three, three sets of responses. And one is from the people who say, well, no, this, what you're, what you're saying is just absolutely horrible. And I am completely unwilling to believe that war kind of actually had this sort of constructive, unintended side effect. Then the other extreme, there are people who yeah, I'll give my spiel and say, well, duh, you know, this is completely obvious. You're <laughs> nothing new. We all know this already. 
And then there's the group in the middle who uh, say, well, OK, well, we'll listen to what you say. And some of them will conclude, oh, yeah, maybe you're right. Some will conclude, no, you're complete idiots. Um, so you have these three different groups. And what I found is in different settings, the proportions, how the proportions break down between the three varies. And so in most academic settings, um, there's a lot of people in the first group who really, really don't want, just don't want to talk about this. Mm. I mean, you know, one of the big developments in history departments in the last 30 years has been that military history has been virtually wiped out in academic history departments. Mm. Uh, people just don't want to talk about it. And I think the, the, their feeling is that by talking about war and treating it as a, a serious topic, you're somehow legitimizing it, mm. saying that th this is a, a really good thing for us to be militaristic. Uh, and also when I talked about my book in Germany, um, there was a, a just a lot of people just said, we really don't want people talking this sort of way. And that may be a good thing. Yes, yes, you see <laughs> historical reasons for this. <laughs> so yeah, the, the, yeah, it sort of varies from It's from like when we place. people complain about the Japanese not doing enough in Afghanistan. <laughs> yeah, well, yes. yeah, do you really want <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, well, it, uh, let's open it to questions. And if you have a question, can you identify yourself and wait for, your mic, wait for the mic? And we'll start with this gentleman here. Thanks very much. Uh, first, thanks for the engaging talk. Uh, a question. I, if you take it back to where you were and you're talking about evolutionary and, and you know, we've gotten better, all right, and government has done that in that sense, okay? I'm sitting here thinking, uh, say, um, in the ma that's in the macro world. In the micro world, you've got in Chicago this week 45, uh, what, 45 people shot on Easter. And you look at that and you say, oh, my God. But if you yeah. take your theory and do it, a lot of those, I work with inner cities, they don't feel a, a connection to government. So would you be mm -hmm. willing to take it down that way and say that that's part of it too? Or is that, mm -hmm. are they two totally unrelated issues? So the macro and the micro. Yeah, no, a great question. I think this, this macro micro thing is, is just like hugely important in the, the sort of work that I've been doing the last few years. Because I guess one, one of the things that keeps striking me is how often um, the micro experience that produces the macro outcome is completely different from the actual, actual macro outcome. And of course, this is something that um, natural scientists have gotten really into in the last 30 or 40 years, especially the physicists, how you know, what's going on at the subatomic level is entirely different from the, the way that the universe appears to work, which uh, I don't think it's, it's <laughs> kind of cool that there are these similarities between all these different fields. But yeah, I think that the macro and the micro, though, are, are very tightly interlinked. And it seems to me, and again, I'm sure there's people in this room who know a lot more about uh, you in particular, you know a lot more about what's going on in inner cities um, than, than I do, although we used to live on the south side of Chicago. But uh, that, um, I would say to some extent that you know, the, the pockets of relatively high violence that we continue to get are largely because of the failure of governments to penetrate these regions. And, and as you said, I mean, when we lived on the south side of Chicago, it, it wasn't like law and order had broken down or anything like this. But if you called the cops, you're going to be waiting a while before anybody shows up. But actually, where I live now in the Santa Cruz Mountains in California, it's very different from the south side of Chicago. But a similar sort of thing. There's very few police uh, out where we are. Um, you call the cops, it will be a, a really long while before they show up. And consequence of this is you know, a lot of people just assume we, we do need to take uh, things into our own hands. I and mean, it's a very heavily armed population where I live. I mean, everybody has dogs, almost everybody has guns. And um, I think uh, w w this is one reason I would say why gun ownership is so popular in the US. I think a lot of people, even if they live in very uh, sort of heavily government penetrated, very police and safe areas, there's this strong um, belief that government shouldn't be doing a lot of these things and you should be doing them yourselves. So yeah, I think the two are, are very strongly linked. Gentleman here. Have you given any thought as to why uh, the violence against women in warfare yeah, and this again, um, you know, sort of horrifying. But once you start studying, it kind of obsessively, it sort of takes takes over when you start studying. It's just sort of obsessively interesting problem. I mean, it's so horrifying. Um, yeah, I mean, this has always been a big part of war. And you read the ancient literature, and they are absolutely unambiguous. You go to war to kill the men and rape the women. That's what you do. And this is something where I think the the um, sort of 
evolutionary perspective is extremely useful. Because I mean, this has been a huge bone of contention in feminist history over uh, just you know, where does rape fit into a uh, larger scale historical story. And one of the, the, the big, the, the, the point at which I think our, our understanding of the biological evolution of violence really changes is 1973 when Jane Goodall is out at a Gombe research station in Tanzania studying chimpanzees. Um, and up to that point, the general picture is that chimps are these lovable, lovable creatures. And she's made uh, chimpanzees famous with these National Geographic shows about them. And in 1973, they discover that the two communities they're studying, two chimp groups, have just gone to war with each other. And um, one of the groups over the next four years, uh, they systematically beat to death all of the males in the other group. They beat and rape all of the females. They kill some of the females, uh, kidnap the others and bring them into their own group. They kill all the children in the other group. And they take over the hunting range of the other group. And um, this uh, set off this uproar in, uh, in evolutionary biology. Right? What does this mean? Some people say this means um, Humans are hardwired for violence. We share 98% of our DNA with the chimps. It means we're just hardwired for violence. And then in the 1980s, people discovered that the, the bonobo chimpanzees, like pygmy chimps, very closely related to regular chimps, also have 98% DNA overlap with us. They almost never use violence. And um, the, the implication of this difference uh, seems pretty clearly to, to be that the two groups are separated by the Congo River. They've uh, been separated about 1.3 million years. And across this period, they're in slightly different environments. And they've evolved off in wildly different directions. And the bonobos lived in an environment where violence just paid less. They moved toward using less of it. And I think what we learn from this is that even though um, violence against women has been such an integral part of war, as far as we can tell, as far back as war goes. Um, because we're able to evolve culturally as well as biologically, there is no reason why violence against women has to be a hardwired part of the human story. And of course, even though um, you know, we, we hear all these just horrifying stories, like the, all the rapes committed by the Red Army at the end of World War II, or by, uh, in the Indian-Pakistani wars in the 1970s, the amount of um, rape that goes on in war seems to have declined uh, quite sharply. And I say seems to because this is something that is really, really difficult to quantify. I mean, the, the stuff that um, I'm doing, one reason why I concentrate so much on violent death is that this is something you can, uh, up to a point at least, trace back a very long way through the skeletal record of lethal traumas on the skeletons and how these increase and decrease over time. Whereas, um, something, you know, something in ways you know, almost as horrifying an effect of war, the, the rape, uh, that is something you're entirely reliant on the written record. And of course, most of the time, you can't believe what's being written. I think mm. it, uh, probably it would be fair to say we can't trace this back statistically much beyond the 20th century, frankly. So yeah, I think this is a big part of the story, but it's a part I actually say rather little. I say a bit about it in my book, but rather little, because using the methods I use, I think it's rather hard to say a lot about it. Gentleman here. Hi. Thanks again. It is fascinating. Thank you. Um, can you compare war with sort of non-war mm -hmm. catastrophic events like um, the Black Death or, uh -huh. or uh, crop failures or fail uh, when an empire fails to maintain the waterworks that support mm -hmm. agriculture? Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, one of my colleagues at Stanford actually brought this up with me just recently. And I was telling him about what this book was about. And he says, oh, yeah, you're just jumping onto the same bandwagon the economists have been on for ages. Because our big thing is that you know, the, the worse something appears to be, the better it is. This is what, what economists appear to think. And the Black Death, the example you use, is the classic example for the economists. Because uh, um, one, one of the big arguments in economic history has developed across the last 30, 40 years is that the most important thing uh, for raising standards of living and reducing inequality ever in European history was the Black Death. It kills half the population in the space of a couple of decades. And it wildly changes the, land, uh, the labor to land ratio. And so suddenly now there's a lot of land available relative to the population. So people don't have to work these you know, crappy little fields that their fathers and grandfathers worked. They just concentrate on the good stuff. Wages go up enormously for ordinary people. Um, inequality declines sharply. But then as the population grows over the next few centuries, it all kind of goes back downhill again. And so this guy was saying, well, hey, you're just saying the same thing as we're saying. Um, that you know, terrible things uh, tend to drive um, good consequences. 
And um, yeah, I, I don't really know if this is true as a sort of all-embracing generalization or not. But I think certainly it is sometimes true. And I mean, one something that struck me just a couple of weeks ago, I was reading uh, this new book that's making a lot of headlines at the moment, Thomas Piketty's book, Capital in the 21st Century. You know, his big argument is that the, the, it's inherent in the nature of capitalism, that um, the, the rents extracted by the owners of capital are greater than the rents extracted by the sellers of labor. So the gap between the rich and the poor inevitably widens and widens. And he says the only thing that um, ever turned that around, really, was World War II, which wiped out a lot of the equity of the rich and forced societies to change in ways which closed the gap between the rich and the poor. And then by the late 1970s, the effects of World War II were beginning to wear off, and that's why we now see uh, widening inequality. Um, and uh, another colleague of mine at Stanford is now writing a book uh, trying to extend this argument back right to the times of the Roman Empire, saying, hey, you know, we see the same thing over and over again. And it's not just wars. Um, famines, great way to, to lessen the inequality. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, may, maybe this is true. I, I kind of hope not. It's, um, I think it has a very gloomy implications if it is true. Gentleman here. Yeah, um, my name is Javier Ruperez. I was the Spice Ambassador to uh, the, the United States some years back. Um, if I may go back to the Hitler question, I, I hope there are not many Germans around. Um, <laughs> well, you know very well that in these last few weeks uh, after uh, Putin's grabbing of Crimea, the, the, there's been a lot of temptation to compare Hitler yeah, with Putin and uh, drawing some comparisons between what happened uh, in the 30s and what is happening ra right now. And, uh, and drawing the conclusions, that after all, we might, uh, we might be uh, seeing something similar in terms of appeasement, in terms of mm -hmm. people uh, criticizing appeasement and so on and so forth. Can you uh, tell us how do you see the situation, uh, do whether uh, there is mm -hmm. something to be compared, whether we can learn for, from history, where history is going to repeat itself? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, people, people love making these Munich analogies, and they make them with many, many things, and most of the time the analogies are, are kind of silly. Um, I think the, the, you know, with Putin in Crimea, the analogy this time, I think it, it is a very tempting analogy to make. Um, I mean, I guess I, the, the big difference I, I would see is that you know, Russia in 2014 is not Germany in 1938. And Russia, I don't think... Um, in any realistic scenario, I don't think Russia poses the same sort of threat to the global order that Nazi Germany did. Because the the, um, the caveat has to be that you know, Russia is still the world's great biggest nuclear power. If their missiles actually work, they're the world's biggest nuclear power. And so potentially they could um, do more damage than anybody. But I think the, a scenario in which a nuclear war breaks out over Crimea is so wildly unlikely that uh, we can... I hope we can probably safely discount that. But I guess where, where I see the analogy with, with uh, Sudetenland um, maybe not being totally ridiculous is in thinking of the, the possible consequences of Putin getting away with what he's doing, uh, which I think... It, um, a few years ago, I was invited to a, a conference in Canberra in Australia where, uh, by a group that had been responsible for drawing up the 2009 Australian um, defense white paper, talking about what their long-term strategy would be. And the, uh, they, they said in this white paper, you know, the, the big challenge facing Australia is that uh, we have to make a, a choice of some kind. We might have to make a choice of some kind between our strategic partner, which is the USA, and our economic partner, which is China. Um, and the paper sort of implied that the choice would be to lean toward America. But then the whole white paper had been about how we can avoid offending the Chinese. And so these guys get just torn apart in the press. So they say, okay, we'll have another conference. We'll bring in different people this time and talk to them about what we should do. So they do this, and then they, this is in 2011, just around the time of uh, when Obama announces the, the pivot toward Asia, and uh, the Australian government announces, yes, we are definitely leaning even more strongly toward America now. But then they publish a new defense white paper last year, which says exactly the opposite. It's all about scaling down Australia's commitment to um, armed forces, even more about leaning toward China. And I think the governments in the West Pacific are just in this very difficult position. And I think you, you do sort of have this choice to make. Are we going to gravitate toward Beijing now, while we still think we can get a pretty good deal from the Chinese? Or are we going to wait to be disappointed by the Americans? I and mean, my <laughs> suspicion is that 
if there are really serious consequences come out of the Crimean episode, it's going to be this sort of ripple effect of people saying, we, you know, the US and Britain guaranteed the integrity of Ukraine's borders 20 years ago and have done nothing when it's been violated. And you know, if I were in Seoul or Tokyo, I, I know what conclusions I would draw from that. So, I mean, I guess I think you know, there are ways in which the analogy can be taken way too far. But I think it's not, it's not entirely a ridiculous analogy to make. Gentleman over here. Thank, thank you. Matteo Faini. I'm a graduate student in international security. I was wondering what your thoughts are on the effects of war on the rise of and fall of societies within the international hierarchy. Mm -hmm. So the most common explanation as to why European countries were able to conquer the rest of the world starting in the 15, uh, in the 15th century is that they competed so much one with yeah. the other that they were able to develop technologies that then allowed them to conquer well, the, yeah. the Mughal Empire, Chinese Empire, the Maya Empire, and so on. At the same time, however, the war which brought Europe up arguably brought Europe down in the 20th century. So what are do you have a, an explanation as to when war leads to a rise in international hierarchy and when it does the opposite? Mm -hmm. Yeah, gosh, great question. I guess I haven't really given it much serious thought on the sort of uh, generalizing theoretical level. So uh, I, I will have to do that so the next time people uh, ask me, I have a, a good answer to give instead of rambling on, which is what I will now do for a moment. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think I mean, with, in the 15th century, I think there is a lot of truth in, in this, what, what I think has now become the, the most popular theory, that uh, you know, what drives Europe's military success is the fact that it's broken up into all these separate states that are constantly fighting against each other and pushes the Europeans to improve on these, uh, the, the firearms technology and the ships. Um, because uh, the great irony of the European world takeover story is that the guns and the ships that the Europeans rely on are actually invented in China. Mm. And uh, the Chinese are the first ones to develop ocean-going ships that can reliably cross oceans. And real guns, uh, by which people normally mean uh, like a weapon with gunpowder, where the gunpowder um, explodes so fast you can fire a projectile out of it. The Chinese invent all this stuff. Uh, but then it's the Europeans who really ramp them up and make them, uh, make them actually very effective weapons. And I think you know, part of it is definitely this thing of Europeans fighting each other. Part of it, I think, is also geographical, though. And there's a great book written on this, a book that got almost totally ignored by a man named Kenneth Chase, in the book called, just called Firearms. And what he points out is that China, um, in the early 14th century, China ramps up gunnery technology really quickly, because there's a big civil war going on. And a lot of it has been fought in the Yangtze Valley by ships in very confined spaces, and a lot of sieges going on. All these are contexts in which gunnery is, becomes a decisive weapon really quickly, a lot of pressure to make better guns. Once the Civil War is uh, over, the main military threat China faces is, tends to be these steppe nomads. And the guns in the 15th century are just very, very slow firing, which doesn't matter if you're shooting against a fortress, because it's not going anywhere. But if you're shooting against cavalry, the guns are not much use in the 15th century. Whereas the Europeans are fighting wars much more like the ones in the Yangtze Valley in China. And so the Europeans keep fighting these wars and they keep getting driven, the, the, the technology gets driven up and up and up in Europe. And it's not really, I mean, until really yeah, 1650, 1700, that you get to the point you've got guns that can actually shoot down cavalry. And you can reload quick enough to shoot the cavalry when you're charging, they're, they're charging you. And at that point, um, the Chinese and the Japanese and Koreans all begun in the 16th century, begin glomming very hard onto the European technology. And the Japanese, I mean, by the late 16th century, the Japanese are making the best guns in the world. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a fascinating story. Um, but I tell the story basically because I don't have a good answer to your question, but I will go away and think about it. So. <laughs> Lady here. Thank you. I haven't heard you say anything about the role of religion mm -hmm. in wars. And it seems to me that they go back way, way back, and that they dominated so many wars. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think yeah, religion is a huge part of the story. And I, I say quite a lot about religion in my book. But um, I am one of the people who think that religion is a secondary factor in, in all these stories. I'm one of the die-hard materialists in the world. There's still a few of us left. Uh, and in fact, I mean, I would extend this more generally to culture of almost all kinds. I think it's, 
cultural changes, I feel strongly are driven by changes in the material world. In the, the book that uh, Peter mentioned, Why the West Rules for Now, one of the things I keep saying in that book is that each age gets the thought it needs. As geography and material factors of various kinds force new questions onto people, people start thinking about these questions. And if the questions can be solved, people tend to start solving them. And like uh, in the Why the West Rules book, I suggest that you know, the reason uh, you get a scientific revolution in Europe is, is not because Europeans are smarter than the Chinese or the Arabs or the Indians or anybody like this, but because by 1600, Europeans are beginning to confront a, a new kind of problem that nobody else in the world has had before, which is driven by this stuff I was just blathering on about with the ships and the guns. That Europeans, once these new ships arrive, um, the Atlantic Ocean is suddenly transformed from being a barrier which cuts Europe off from the rest of the world because you can't do anything with it, it's too big, to being a, a kind of super highway. And now Europeans are able to develop these, this North Atlantic trade where you're zipping around the North Atlantic. And, and historians like to call it the triangular trade. Like say you would start off in Liverpool, say, with a, a shipment of blankets and pipes and guns and manufactured goods. You sail down to West Africa, exchange these for profit for human beings. Then you ship the human beings across to the Caribbean, exchange them again for a profit for sugar or rum. You ship that back to England, sell it again for a profit, um, and, and then use the cash to buy more blankets and hats and everything. Off you go again. And th this turns into the biggest money-generating machine the world has ever seen. And by 1600, a lot of European intellectuals are starting to say, you know, if we could just figure out how the stars move in the skies and how the winds and the tides really work, there is no limit to what we can now do with this knowledge if we can figure these things out. And your people in India, China, the Muslim world, they've been asking similar questions for a long time. But nowhere in the world has it ever been so pressing as it now becomes in Europe. And so in the 16th, 17th century, you get all these European intellectuals who for you know, 2,000 years, the biggest deal has been studying the Bible or studying the Greek mm -hmm. and Roman classics or whatever. And you get a big chunk of them starting to say, no, that's not a big deal anymore. The big deal is explaining the natural world. And so you, I think you know, that's why you, you see that change. And I think I, I would claim you can generalize this to the story of cultural history, religious history more generally. And so I tend to feel that what the religion does is it performs the tasks people need it to perform under any given situation. And so, I mean, like take, take Christianity. That, um, in the Roman Empire, Christianity is, uh, on the whole, I think it is a force for pacification. The, the lesson of Christianity, you know, turn the other cheek, do unto your neighbor, all these things, this is exactly what the Roman upper class wants to hear. Um, and initially, they, they uh, oppress Christianity because it's seen, you know, probably rightly, as a challenge to the established order. Then they really get a hold of it in the fourth century, and say, wow, this is fantastic. Um, this is encouraging everybody not to be violent. We love this. Um, but then once the ancient empires come to bits, you move into the Middle Ages, and you know, there's still plenty of Christians saying uh, nonviolence is the way forward. But you also get stuff like the Crusades. I think when you live in a more violent world, religion tends to get used for more violent ends. And this, I, I, I suspect, my feeling is this has a lot to do with the history of fundamentalisms around the world. And this is the world that the fundamentalists generally tend to live in. So I, I would say it's very much driven by the material forces, but is a, just a, like a super big part of the story. Two quick follow-ups. So was Gibbon right that Christianity was sort of the death knell of the Roman Empire? And, and secondly, do you think non-religious ideologies, I'm thinking you know, communism, fascism, extreme forms of nationalism, mm -hmm. are actually more damaging than religious uh, sort of beliefs in terms of creating conflict? Uh -huh. Yeah, the Gibbon thing, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I would put it the other way around. The, the, yeah. the, more, it's more that the fall of the Roman Empire is responsible for the success of Christianity, uh, mm. is my feeling. But mm. yeah, with the yeah, non-religious type beliefs. So my feeling is that the, you know, the dangerous thing about belief systems of whatever kind is that you know, to some people, uh, they, they, you in, will interpret this belief as saying, that, you know, I now know the, the secrets of the world, and I now know how to make the world a perf perfect place. And if you just do what I say the interpretation of this belief system is, the world will be a perfect place. And if I am able to tell you what to do to perfect the world, then 
you know, really, I mean, you were talking about perfecting the world here. So it <laughs> doesn't matter. I, mean, I suppose this is actually what I'm saying in my book, sort of, as well, scary. Yeah? It doesn't matter how bad the thing is I'm telling you to do. And so, you know, Hitler tells you, just gas the Jews and the world will be perfected. We'll get rid of the corruption in the world. And because you have lots of other genocidal maniacs who had, you know, similar sort of ideas, you just, just hack these Tutsis to pieces and Rwanda will be perfected. And I think it's a, it's a really old story. And this, um, I, I guess my, my gut feeling would be in this regard, it sort of doesn't matter whether it's a religious mm. creed or not. If it's telling you that it's okay to do anything, no matter how awful it is, then this is a really bad thing. Lady over here. Terribly sorry. Oh, sorry. I'm terribly sorry to have come late to your talk, but I actually came from a meeting with a bunch of warriors, a bunch of generals. And in order to maybe explain my observation to you, I just need to tell you a wee bit about what I've done in the last few years. Mm -hmm. I've been, I am a cross-border Pashtun. I literally come from mm -hmm. the worst part of the Avpak region the south of Afghanistan and the northwest of Pakistan, oh, you wow. know, family divided by the border, etc. I've been a senior advisor and a tactical instructor on counterinsurgency on the front lines with the US Marine Corps, and I've come back after tw 12 years. I think one of the most difficult observations for me to make in both Iraq and Afghanistan, working really closely with the American military and then the, you know, b NATO and allied forces, etc has been that a lot of men, a lot of really civilized men, gentlemen, intellectuals, this, that, and the other, come to that environment and become rampant misogynists. Mm. It absolutely mm. stunned me. They ignore women within the communities who have been really successful and might focus on sort of very, very weak women, very mm. oppressed women, but only as a means to putting down the men of the other side. Look mm. at how they treat their women. Uh -huh. Look at what uncivilized pigs they are, that kind of thing. Yet women who could actually give them something, they totally ignored. And I actually had a very nice Canadian civilian telling me, well, basically, women are irrelevant. We only address women's issues. Once we have the peace and stability and we have the environment in which to do it in. So I don't mm -hmm. know you know, what your thoughts on that is, but I feel that counterinsurgency should be a woman's domain. They do it more effectively when oh. they're allowed to, and whether or not you've had to deal with that. Yeah, yeah, and th uh, th that's a really interesting observation, and thank you for the telling me that, because I mean, this, uh, what the, the Canadian guy was saying to you, I mean, this is sort of the conclusion um, that I, found myself drifting toward as I was writing this book, that you know, uh, you know, most military histories tend to be about boys, so you have very few girls in them. And in fact, your most, most history uh, that gets written about periods before, say, roughly 1800 in the West, tends to be about boys again. You know, all of the sources from the medieval and ancient worlds tend to be written by and for men. Um, and I think there's a reason for this. And I, I got very interested in this as I was writing the book, because um, I'm sure you know, many of you will have come across Steve Pinker's book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, which I think is a great book. Uh, one of the best descriptions of this decline in violence across the last 500 years has ever been published. It's a great book. Um, but the, one of the big differences between my book and Steve Pinker's book is that um, I think that by looking at it as a continuous narrative across 10,000 years, you get to see, as I was saying, you know, these three separate periods of what happened with the rise and fall of violence and compare and contrast them and identify a single force the history of war that's driven the whole thing. Whereas Pinker is more interested in producing kind of a, a large set of variables that have influenced the decline of violence in recent times. And one of the, va the variables he talks about is feminization. Uh, and what he suggests, I think, you know, quite, quite sensibly says, well, you, know, you read the literature produced through most of history. Like you pick up a play by Shakespeare or something. It's all about you know, one guy says something about how some other guy's cloak looks weird. And so the second guy pulls out his dagger and stabs the first guy to death. And everybody says, good work. You, that was exactly <laughs> what this guy was asking for. And it goes through so much of history. The, the definition of being a man of honor means you're a man who will violently defend his honor against insults. But of course, more recently, that has changed dramatically. And now, uh, yeah, if, if somebody in the audience asked me a question I really didn't like and I leapt up and ran down and punched you in the face, people would say, well, that is not the behavior of a man of honor. A man of honor now is one who controls these, these 
what we now think of as stupid, destructive emotions. And one of Pinker's suggestions is that this has really been driven by a kind of feminization of values, that um, as women have become more empowered and had a bigger voice in, in politics particularly, but in the culture more generally, We've gone from saying that uh, these sort of you know, very male ways of behaving. So if you look at police blotters really anywhere in the world, you see that 90 to 95 percent of the violent crime is committed by young men. You look at chimpanzees, 90 to 95 percent committed by young males as well. Um, this is a, an evolved male way of solving arguments is to attack the other person. Uh, it's not a way that females in humans or chimpanzees have, have normally evolved um, to deal with things. Um, and so what, what Pinker suggests is that uh, perhaps you know, part of the reason males evolved this way is a kind of psychological rush you get from using violence. There's a reward from using violence in your brain, a kind of uh, almost you know, a drug effect from using violence to solve your problems. And he suggests that one of the things that's happened in the last 200 years is we've seen macho go from being admi generally admired and praised to being sort of ridiculous. And you know, if you act too violently, you go to a dinner party and behave violently again. Everybody's just going to stare at you and they're not going to ask you back again. Um, and he suggests that this has actually changed the way our, ways our brains work. Mm -hmm. But I, I was thinking about this as I did my book, because uh, I felt that you, if you look back at the, the previous occasion on which there was a great pacification in the ancient world, you see some writing a little bit like some of the things people say currently about values and about the, the sort of impact of women on their values. You see something a little bit like that in the Roman Empire. And you see things a little bit like what people currently say about, say, the, the role of commerce in making violence less attractive. You see little traces of these same things 2,000 years ago. Then they sort of disappear completely again in the Middle Ages. And my hunch, although you know, we've only got three cases to compare here, so it can only really be a hunch, my hunch is that um, the feminization of society and the appeal to reason rather than force and the impact of commerce uh, and democracy and dissuading people from acting violently, these are things that only really kick in when the level of violence has been driven below a certain level. Um, and then when, when so the world has to be made safe enough for these values to start influencing people. And then they do in a big way. And clearly in, in our own world, these are all really important forces. So I mean, I guess me and my uh, highly uninformed opinion um, mm -hmm. it would be that you're probably this guy you were talking to, you know, maybe he's right. That um, o only when a certain level of law and order has been put in place can we get the sort of transformations you're, you're talking about. as, you know, uh, as an entity in our own rights. Yeah, well, I guess really I, mean, I, I, terrible don't, I don't know whether that is the only way to do this. But I, mean, yeah. I, I guess my hunch from, you know, from the history that I've read would be something has to be done to create a secure environment before the sort of changes you're, you're, you're talking about are likely to be very successful. And whether that means kowtowing to the patriarchs or whether it means taking the patriarchs out and shooting them um, or something else. <laughs> Do we have a, we have time for one more question? Gentleman here. Uh, yes, there, there was a book written in the 60s by Conrad Lorenz mm, about yeah. uh, on aggression and territorial imperative. Uh, I guess, we, are we still uh, wired that way? Yeah, we, we've moved, a l the, the bi well I say we, the biologists, obviously I know like, nothing about this field, all I know is from talking to experts and reading what they've written. But, yeah, the biologists have moved on a very long way since then. But <laughs> back in the 60s, before we really, before the biologists, say we again, before the biologists had really begun to collect good data on, on patterns of violence in other species, there was a really widespread assumption that human um, lethal violence that humans commit was almost unique in the animal kingdom, and particularly kind of group lethal violence, where you know, a whole community of uh, humans gets together and attacks another community. There's a strong feeling that this is pretty much unique in the animal world. And now we just know so much more about this. And um, uh, I, I think, uh, again, so this is just, just my sense of where the biologists are. My, my sense of it is that the, the consensus is that Lorenz was absolutely right to put his finger on territoriality as one of the big drivers in this. But it works in rather more complicated ways than what Lorenz was suggesting. And that um, there are you know, a number of species that will use lethal violence, a number of species that use group violence. And um, lethal violence 
uh, if you discount sort of accidental killing of other animals, you fight one, gets injured, and then goes off and sort of dies of an infection or something, deliberate killing between species is pretty much limited to social animals that can cooperate as groups, and pretty much limited to situations where a group of animals will encounter an isolated individual or a very small number of, an, mm. uh, of the other side and can attack safely knowing that the risk of they themselves getting injured is really, really low. And that what is unique with humans is this thing where we have been able to train young men normally, train young men to go right up to large numbers of people who are trying to kill them and to stand there and duke it out. So I mean, that is really, really unusual. And I suggest in the book that in some ways, it's like the, it's the invention of discipline is the thing that um, really makes Le the, the biggest success story of Leviathans. Getting young men, training them, imbuing them with the military arts and virtues and drawbacks too. To actually you know, walk up to guys armed with really sharp spears and just stand there and keep stabbing until your side wins. That, that is unique to us. Well, on that, uh, we will thank you very much, sir. <laughs> thank you very much.